Welcome to the Environmental Transformation Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Grady. Today's guest is John Robinson, and he's the co-founder and principal of Mazarine Ventures. Mazarine is a uh, tech, climate tech uh, adventure company, and um, we're going to talk about venture capital and venture investment. And John, welcome to the show. Hey, Sean. It's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Yes, absolutely. So, John, give us a little bit about yourself. Talk a little bit about, if you could, uh, Mazarine Ventures, what you guys do and and uh, what your strategy is. Yeah, I'll, I'll keep it um, short and sweet. Um, there's basically three things that are important to know about Mazarine. Number one, our founding team comes from water and wastewater. We spent, um, my business partner spent their entire career in water and wastewater. I'm a newcomer and only 15 years in the business, but we're water, wastewater technology um, practitioners. And instead of getting into engineering or sales and marketing for a corporate, we decided to focus on backing early stage companies that have innovations that address some aspect of water and wastewater. So that's number one. We come from water focused on technologies that address it. Number two, we love early stage. We love it so much that we even um, had the crazy idea to create our own skunk works, uh, an incubator called Mazarine Labs, uh, which is sort of a luxury as a VC because we can mess around with good ideas, bad ideas, maverick ideas, crazy ideas. We see sure. deals every day as, as any VC would do, but like, ah, it'll be nice if someone to do this or that. And as hypothesis-oriented investors, we're like, you know, maybe we could create something or maybe we could cobble together a few things and create it. So number two is we're extremely uh, entrepreneurial, but you have right. to be to be the stage. And the third and final thing, which is maybe a good segue into today's discussion, is um, we've learned over the years as water, wastewater practitioners that water, unfortunately, doesn't get the attention and the money and the respect that it rightly deserves and as much as we'd like that to change, it, it seems like water just is, is, is a tough sell for, for money and for um, Main Street investors. So we looked at climate and climate is no shortage of, of money going after climate deals, climate tech. So the question is, how does water fit within climate? On the, on the mitigation decarb side, um, water only contributes to about 10% of greenhouse gas emissions. So there's not too much you can do there, but it's necessarily pumping and treating water should reduce their carbon greenhouse gas emissions. So we, we've ended up um, building a fund on the climate adaptation side of climate. So the thesis there is that as much as we need to decarbonize and net zero and decarb efforts are great, things are sort of getting, seem like they're getting worse. And so we're going to need technologies that help industry and society deal with the change climate which is less of a carbon problem and more of a water problem. So we're water VC operating in climate. Um, and that uh, sort of the three things you need to know about us. Um, about yourself. I am a fluent speaker of Mandarin Chinese, lived in wow. China for seven years, picked up the language and more than conservation uh, uh, conversation. I, I do business in Chinese. I used to not doing so much there anymore. I started, I pick up a new hobby every year. Um, three years ago, I picked up uh, snowboarding, learned it, and can shred the mountain a little bit now. Two years, I picked up piano. Not very good, but can play some Christmas songs on the piano and maybe a happy birthday or two. And then last year, I picked up kite surfing, which is harnessing the power of the wind to pull you across the water. So those are three things about me. Um, I am married, uh, live in London, England, and my wife and I are expecting our first child in October. Oh, congrats. Fantastic. <laughs> That's going to be a life changer. That's awesome. That's great. Yeah. Well, so so why specify in specifically in water? You know, mm -hmm. is water, you know, kind of like the new gold for you guys? What's what's up with that? I get it why people say water is a new gold, but we would argue that water's always been more important for gold than gold. I mean, it's catchy and it sounds interesting to say, but you go back and throughout history, water is, cities have always been built next to water, industry and commerce and agriculture is always just tied to water. It's, like, it's, it's always been the most important thing. And if you talk to 
people in thermal electric power, coal and nuclear, water is lifeblood of, of cooling within power plants, hydroelectric power, manufacturing, apparel, pulled paper. It's a huge part of, of industry. And then in my home, water is hygiene, water's health, water's cleanliness. So just in terms of from a business perspective, water is life, water's everything, water's the most precious resource, water's the future. Those are all factual, but they don't really work uh, as an investment thesis, as a checkbook looking to invest and uh, around a taxonomy and a deal flow and some exits. You've got to find some better framing to hang your hat on. In the VC community, we call it a thesis. Our thesis is water is a risk. Water's a problem. Water's a headache. Yes, it's a protagonist. It gives life. Recently, water is a protagonist, disruptor of the story. So we've chosen a thesis that is sees water more as a problem, which is a gloomier thesis, but it's a functional um, way of working around something that is hard to you're get. To, yeah, you're trying to solve problems associated with that thesis, right? And which is the climate tech or the tech you're looking at to. Yeah. So our north star, our north star, in a couple words, is water risk. Yeah. Which which includes utilities, drinking yep. water, wastewater utilities. They have inefficiencies. They have risks. They have problems. But if you take a step back and you look at water risk, you find yourself in the built environment, property. You find yourself in aquaculture, agriculture, financial services, real estate, manufacturing, hydropower, like so many other industries. Wake up every day to water headaches and water risk. Yeah, there's a lot of it. Not in the water industry. Right. So it, as an investor, you've got to find a way to approach that. So instead of saying we're water investors or what are tech investors, it's what are risk technology investors. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, I was looking on your website and uh, you, you guys have uh, three different funds going on right now or, or that you're, you've been managing. Can you talk about the differences between the funds? right now and just kind of give the listeners an idea of what you're doing in those three funds you're working through. Yeah. Well, fund one is, is complete. Um, we've, we've got 12 portfolio companies in there. I won't go through all of them, um, but they're 12 of our favorite companies in the world. Um, our first check was in a company called Aqua membrane, um, Aqua membranes in January, 2019. So we're still kind of new to this. And over the since 2019 to today, we've 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 invested between fifty thousand and five hundred thousand dollars in um, these twelve companies in, individually. Yep. Um, nine of the twelve, their IP is essentially data science. If you talk to nine of these founders, what is your IP? They would say we are producing data on water flow or water quality or applying some analytics to something water related. It's essentially data science tools. Right. Three of the companies are process engineering. Um, the exits for each of those companies as, as a, as a VC, people always ask us, what markets are you in? And they're thinking agriculture or industrial municipal or residential commercial. We, we live in terms of exit markets. So who's going to take us out from our investment in conservation labs or flume or clear or Pani. So, a big part of our day-to-day -day job is figuring out what corporates and strategics have an appetite for companies we've invested in. Um, all of our 12 uh, fund one companies are doing well. Um, some are nearing all of them. We invested in them when they were on their way to a million dollars in sales. And a few of them now it's probably half are on their way to 10 million. Some of them are already there and some are still kind of around a million. Um, but really happy with that portfolio. The thesis there uh, was, because it's a closed fund now, was um, bringing e efficiencies to the way that water is managed and used. Okay, that's good. And so if you can bring efficiencies to something, you can manage risk. Right. Fund two, uh, which we just announced in January, we decided to put more money into one of our fund one companies, Swirl Tax. And then we just put money into one of our fund one companies, EQL because we like what they're doing and the founders are doing a great job and we wanted a, another bite of the apple, so to speak, out of our fund two. Fund two's thesis is the same, between 50,000 and half a million dollars into a company. Um, and the companies in there um, are and will be, uh, we'll probably build that up to 12, 14 companies in, uh, 
approaching some sort of inefficiency relating to the management of use of water. And these companies cut across. I mean, Clear is in pool tech. Aquamembranes is, is in bringing efficiencies to RO membranes, which cuts across uh, municipal and industrial. AgCore is a fintech company focused on water and ag and finance. I mean, we cut across so many different verticals, which gives us uh, diversification, which is important for a fund. Absolutely. So fund one, two, and then somewhere in the middle there, we decided we needed an incubator. So we started Mazarine Labs. We've got a bunch of stuff going on there. Um, and then uh, we started to hang out with a lot of the climate crowd and they were like we're not doing water we're doing climate so we pulled back the, the curtain a little bit it's like climate means carbon for them and so we realized that there's this mitigation industry of stopping and slowing greenhouse gas emissions which is great we're not against it that industry is mature it's crowded so we sort of challenged our own sort of knowledge of climate and we thought what else could you do in climate and after poking around a bit, we stumbled across this word adaptation. And if you Google search for your audience, climate adaptation, you'll find a whole ecosystem of public and private sector entities, businesses, investors who are focused on helping industry and society adapt or be more resilient in the face of changes happening in climate. So we have coined the term climate adaptation tech, CAT. Um, and that is... Uh, Checks between 500,000 and 5 million focused on growth stage companies that have innovations that help their customers uh, adapt to an already changed climate. So it's not that we're giving up on carbon. Um, in fact, we're doing an event in October. Half of the program is on fighting climate change and half is on living with it. Right. Yep. And so our fund three is entirely focused on the live with it, the deal with it side which is where and how water practitioners can lend a hand in climate on the adaptation side. But it's a little gloomy, it's a little defeatist, because it's kind of just saying things are gonna get worse before they get better, as, as yeah. opposed to the warming atmosphere. And that's an inconvenient yeah. um, narrative. A lot of people still are gonna win the war on carbon. Um, so that's sort of uh, how we're structured in terms of our vehicles. The money behind everything in Mazarin comes from family offices, individuals um, that have done well and want to participate in okay. um, the deal flow. Um, so it's kind of like your limited partners question I was going to throw out there. It's like you've got these, uh, you know, like you said, private offices, individuals who are really interested in supporting your, your thesis uh, with the investment strategy, right? Our um, thesis is attractive to um, probably more attractive to the family office checkbook than the corporate. Um, we've talked to a lot of corporates over the years and we have a contractual relationship with one corporate, but it's not, a, it's not an LPGP relationship. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the dollars, that are going to work through Mazarine um, 100% from family money. Gotcha. Um, we do have a new mandate um, that kind of came out of left field a little bit. A relatively large private equity house came to us and said, we want to put private equity check size money, not VC stuff, but like larger checks into water. And they didn't really have a, um, a working thesis around it. And so mm -hmm. um, we are now uh, a partner of a large PE house, helping them come in and drop significant amount of money into water. And the thesis that I think we're going to arrive at with them is to come in and accelerate the, the already existing trend of as a service, wastewater as a service, water as a service, stormwater as a service. Right. Ice service the as a service economy right in water and wastewater everyone talks about it and there's you know, people nibble, nibbling around the edges of it but with this private equity company's large check we will be able to accelerate some more investment into startups into as a, well they're not it's not going to go to startups it's going to go oh. into mature mid-market companies oh. okay private equity money private equity wouldn't want to put money into a startups Gotcha. Like, so it's going into sort of mid-market companies 
and then some tuck-ins, add some other startups to put around that that company. Right. So those are some of the things that are sort of um, operational that we're doing um, at Mazarine. That's awesome. That's really encouraging to hear. I mean, that's that sounds pretty exciting actually for you know somebody reaching out and wanting to you know invest in in Mazarine Ventures to to help them. Um, when you guys are evaluating potential startup candidates, what are you guys looking for? Like, you know, how do you evaluate them? It sounds cliche, Sean, but um, it's all about the founder <laughs> and 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 their um, understanding who they are as a person. Um, just briefly, in a minute, we use something we call our CIA framework, not mainly Virginia and CIA, but like character intellect access. What is this person's character? It's not, did they lie about the numbers in the deck, but like, how do they treat other people? How do they see the world? Are they intellectually curious? Were they raised well? It sounds funny, but like character has got to be number one. So we score, quantify people. I like the second intellect. Is this founder intelligent, book smart, or smart, flip it over, you get a better result for the customer? or bright, visionary, light bulb, see the future. Um, so that I bit, the intellect is like, what kind of CEO, assuming the character's good, what are we dealing with upstairs? And they're all important, like an intelligent CEO, a smart CEO, a bright CEO. People might use those interchangeably, but for us, book smart, um, hacking smart. better, and then just like visionary. And then the last bit of how we look at founders is um, access. CIA access. Does this person know people, places, or things that can be helpful? Get your brother-in-law to do your legal work. Get your neighbor to do your website. Hire your university roommate to do some stuff. Like, you know this person. You know that person. Like, yes, build these people around the company and shoestring your way to a business. And we can see that from the outside. If this person has access to, let's just call it non-financial resources, and if they're able to leverage that to build a, com a competitive vision and company, like imagine what they can do if they had a couple million dollars in their bank account. <laughs> so, so that, that, generically, huh. yeah, yes, I, right. I totally, I totally can resonate with that whole. It's the, shoe, uh, it's the you know, shoestring. It's the shoestringing, and and it's it's people that are fighters, and, and they're out nights and weekends, and they they know that. While money is fuel in the tank and you need financial capital, there's other kinds of capital that are equally, if not more important, human capital, intellectual capital, what's the strategy, and most importantly, social capital, the endorsement of somebody who's in name. So we look at a company and a founder, to your question, the founder's got good character and they're smart or intelligent or whatever, and wait a second, they've got that person on their board? Where's my checkbook? Because that person, their name on the board, assuming they know they're on the board, sometimes people throw in names of old professors. And if they know their names on the board, that person's name and their endorsement is worth, worth more than $500,000. So we like to see founders that are able to raise that kind of capital. And then the money is easy. If you can get an endorsement of someone who's a name, the right strategy up the mountain, the intellectual capital, and then you've got a, a core team of human capital, right? The money just will raise itself at that point. I know it sounds overly simplistic, but no, but that's a great that's a great analysis and assessment of how you guys you know evaluate startup companies. I mean, and, that's and then what, one other thing we look for when we look at early stage companies and founders don't always have this in their deck. So if there's any out there listening, we like this slide. This is what our industry looks like in 2027. Slide. So it's 2023 now. If you're in today's market, you're already losing because you're a startup and like you're not going to be selling that much this year, next year, onesie, twosie. Right. So where, where are the tailwinds? Where are the inflections that are happening now in the market, whether it's M&A or the news or whatever's happening, a breakthrough in ChatGPT or language learning models? What is happening today that is going to enable you to have the asymmetric advantage in 2027? Right. Travel to 2027 as a time traveler. Come back. And tell me that you see a future that is compelling. That alone is investment grade um, 
an investment grade founder if they're able to do that in the sector. The founders we don't invest in can't look beyond the product. We've got this thing, the darn thing works. We have no competition. Everyone's going to buy this. Tell me about the world in 2027. What do you mean? This thing's amazing. You should invest in this thing. So we like founders that are able to think in terms of long-term positioning. Yeah. Um, that's sort of what we look like. And, and so far we've invested only in North America, but as mentioned, I live in the UK and we're looking to put some money to work in Scandinavia, Europe, Israel, um, England, UK. Yeah. So no, part of my role over here is to find some opportunities for us to get into. That's great. I love that assessment. Thank you for that. Um, you know, what are a few of the hot startups you guys have invested in so far that you really like and that you see? I mean, you, you know, there's a few of them, obviously, I saw on the fund that you have. Uh, fund two wasn't real clear on who you all are investing in. And, and fund what, three, there's, only one in there. there's only one in there. Okay. Um, but, you know, you know, all of our companies are, are, um, are darlings. Um, and maybe that's not the right question for you because I know you yeah, can't really so spot, spotlight one without the other. <laughs> there's companies we're looking at for fund three that I can share with your audience. So our fund three to remind the audience is, is our climate adaptation tech cat fund. We're looking for early stage companies that are over a million or you can make exceptions, but are on their way to 10 million. And they're helping their customers adapt to our new climate reality. Um, upstream. We like what Marshall's doing up there in Boston. They are bringing efficiencies to the, the he'll probably get upset with me because I'm probably getting this wrong, but utilizing satellite imagery um, to inform hydropower and aquatic ecosystem asset managers, lakes, rivers, wetlands managers, improve the visibility into what's going on with their water in relation to their asset. We like that one. Earth Mover out of New York. They are an early stage company that is reimagining the, the data stack of how we manage climate data. So spreadsheets is kind of 1998, 1988. Yeah. There's got to be a better way to manage um, data related to climate. Um, Desolinator um, out of the Netherlands. They are reimagining solar power desal. So it's enabling communities that are in water scarce reasons, regions to generate water for the community without using fossil fuels. Kind of interesting. Yeah, company, like in, company in North Carolina called Natrix, N-A-T-R-X. Um, their innovations will help co coastal communities manage storm swells and sea level rise to a degree by 3D printed barriers that you put off the coast to manage the flow of water coming in. Those barriers, they're printing, massive 3D printers also become a home for marine life. Um, and then they're, in order to do, in order to F, um, realize this, they're using satellite imagery and a lot of remote sensing to figure out where and how coastal communities will experience a changing climate. So Natrix is kind of an interesting one that we've got our eye on. There's a Norwegian company called Seven Analytics, the number seven analytics that we have our eye on. They're making it much easier to understand um, or affordable and easy to understand flood warnings, floods, floods coming in the next 72 hours, 24 hours. What's the kind of text behind that? Um, it's big data. So they're ingesting data um, into their, I think they call them cubes, sort of their mod modules. So pulling in disparate data sources on X, Y, and Z asset. Um, and it, the date in their algorithms will are conditioned or trained in order to understand patterns and probability of something happening. But that, I mean, people have been doing that a long time. It's modeling essentially, right? but um, it's been expensive. So the elites can afford to understand flood risk or big banks or big cities, but like most of humanity can't really afford flood risk monitoring. Um, so they've sort of, they're well at weather intelligence, essentially. I wouldn't call them water tech. They're weather, weather intelligence, but they're entirely focused on water. So that's like, it's water risk. Right. So there's a, um, a number of companies that um, we have our eye on. Um, our fund one, um, 
I'll, I'll pick on I'll pick on the the little guy Clear C L Y R Clear Jeff Jensen down in Houston. He's reimagining the pool business. I mean, we didn't see this coming, and of course, people in your audience are like, "What the hell do pools have to do with water?" It's not the water industry. They don't know AWWA. They don't know Ace. They don't know WefTech. But the industry of pools is massive. It's expensive. Yeah. It's inefficient. Jeff was like, there's got to be a better way to like give me an app, make it easy. And the pool elites and the incumbents were like, well, can't do too much innovation. And Jeff came along and he's like, we're going to break the rules of this industry, not only for hotels and private family homes, but public swimming pools and high school swimming pools that also encounter a lot of microbial risk, in the water for the community. So this is the kind of company that um, um, is, is more in prop tech and smart home than they are the water industry. Yeah. Another small one, another small one, and then I'll get to the other questions. Your audience can reach out to me if they want to go through the companies. A company in Austin, ironically, both these companies are in Texas. EQO, uh, they are a biotech company started by a former oncologist or oncologist researcher, a, a microbiologist, John Higley. He was working in cancer. And what's the key to managing cancer, early detection? So a big part of that is leveraging RNA technology to understand the dynamics of the cancer in the body. Now, I, don't, I, I know I have it, but like what's it doing? So right around that time, there was a, a boil of water alert in Austin, and he started to look at a lot of water problems, surface water problems. He says that lake kind of has cancer. Things are, di things are eating it. They, the quagga mussels and the invasive species are cancerous um, invasives in that lake. What about using RNA to understand how an aquatic ecosystem is becoming impaired with living things, not runoff of nitrate and lead or whatever, but how living things are killing this lake. They're the leader in leveraging eRNA to understand the health of an aquatic ecosystem or a lab, essentially. But they have a, um, a very sophisticated grab sample um, solution that enables owners and operators of surface water assets to understand where and how their asset might be trending the wrong way. So there's a couple of companies in our fun one that we like and um, that we like the prospects going forward. And then... The rest of them are all doing well um, additionally. So when you when you guys are um, you know looking at the various startups and you know what types of investing challenges do you encounter when you know you're looking to you know identify you know a, a candidate? I mean, what what type of is, are there any challenges with the with actually investing in this market for you guys? I would say the biggest the biggest one is founder risk. Okay, something happens to the founder. Yeah. Mentally, physically, emotionally, they can't can't operate the company anymore, and they are that time travel I talked about a few minutes ago. Yeah, so, like they brought the they brought the solution to where it is today, but they really just that's as far as they can take it. Or, or, or um, that's not the biggest problem. That's a second problem. That's a solvable problem. The founder risk in terms of they get sick, they pass away, or uh -huh. they have some sort of health problem that prevents them from running the company and then it's like well let's get somebody else if they're not there running the ship like it's a big 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 number one problem the number two problem is what you refer to is that the the person that started the company that got it to a million dollars in sales is not the person to take it to 10 million dollars in sales right. that's not the number one problem i would say that's number two or three it's a solvable problem as long as the founder has the maturity to know like hey i'm not the one to, to do this so an example of that is our investment in Flume, F-L-U-M-E, in San Luis Obispo, California, reimagining um, smart metering. Eric um, brought the company to two, three million in sales. And then he stepped aside to be the CTO or maybe CSO, I can't remember. And then he brought in his old buddy to, to be the CEO, maturity. That is a good sign. So that's a solvable problem most of the time. Other concerns we have are around, um, I mean, there's always the competition problem that there's other sneaky competitors coming into the space. Exit markets is a big risk for us that keeps me up at night. We thought we were going to sell this company in three to five years to X corporate. 
now that corporate has totally changed the strategy with, without telling us, without asking us. Well, that's uh, got to be frustrating. And now it's like, psh, now we got to reimagine where and how we get our money back from this thing. Well, you know, talk, let's, let's dive into that. Let's double click on that a bit. You talked to, you mentioned it earlier, you know, part of your strategy is the exit strategy, right? You got the investment strategy and then the exit strategy to get your money back out of the fund uh, to, to have uh, success with, you know, and, and set the, the, the firm up for success as you, you know, have invested in it. What does that look like? How, you know, what's that engagement with, you know, investors look like for you guys and, and that process? It sounds, it sounds cliche, Sean, but you actually make your money when you get into something, not when you get out of it. And physically you get money back and you get your bait back and you get some gains. But when well, you yeah, you're making the, you're you're making a, a educated bet that this is a great investment, and then you you know you do that investment, and you when you sell, great. you reap the rewards, right? We're getting in at this price. This is a, right. this company says they're worth five million dollars. That's fine. We'll get into five million. There's our, our shares are coming at that, and our the trade is that we're going to get out of this when it's fifty million company valuation, ten x our money. Right. That's the vision. So. The, yeah, the, the investment strategy is to find the founder and understand the, who understands the market and all that stuff. The exit strategy really is figuring out who has an appetite for this innovation in three to five years and will pay a premium for it. Usually that's a corporate that is in the business and their management suite is like buyer build, buyer build, buyer build. It's like the R&D department probably would be for, prefer to get the $25 million to go build something, but like you know, there's three or 400 deals out there. Amongst them, there's a few that are really interesting that the business units can really use. Why don't we go buy that one? Um, and so we've got to understand those dynamics about what they want to buy and what they need, buy versus build. So, um, but the problem with that is that the turnover in corporates is like churn in, in, in decision makers. So yeah. conferences and have a, have a drink with one of the corporates. Like, oh, I've got the person who is the buyer of this. Great, we're having drinks. We're like, six months later, they moved on to another company. It's like, I'm gonna start over with a new person. The new person wants to take a different direction. So we've kind of learned over the last few years to kind of take a step back and look at a, a company's overarching um, mission and needs without putting too much emphasis on the individual. It sounds a little counterintuitive because it's like, oh, all business is a people business. But people come and go. And so especially in corporates. So you've got to sort of look at the company from 10,000 feet, 30,000 feet and figure out what they're likely to want to buy in the next few years. Um, I, I would say that is probably handicapping our own game. Um, I'd say that's what we're good at. Well, how much, how much are you... That, even though we haven't exited anything yet. We haven't exited anything yet. So okay, we, okay. We solved on that. In all humbleness, we haven't exited yet, but we've got a pretty good idea of who's going to buy every single one of those 12 companies in fund one. No guarantees in this life, but like, we're not like crossing our fingers, hoping somebody, the phone rings and people are like, oh, buy them. Like, it could be a Japanese corporate. It could be German. It could be a private equity group. It could be a U.S. corporate, Canadian corporate. So many ways to slice and dice these companies, but the founders themselves have pretty good pulse. Yeah, they probably have a good idea who would be a great you know, candidate to buy and they know we want to, I mean, I, I didn't mention this at the beginning, Sean, but we are impact investors. Yeah. I didn't mention this at the beginning. I, the, the money that we are putting to work in the world it is not to make money. It's to generate social and environmental impact relating to water. The only reason we're talking about exits is because this little company doing 10 million in sales with 300 customers, not enough impact. How could this company's technology create more impact for humanity, get gobbled up by a corporate and bring that to Botswana yeah. and Bangladesh and Beijing? Then you're making more impact. So the, the only way we can really realize our impact goals is to exit stuff to larger distribution networks, corporates. And that helps us reach our goals. And the money that comes back, we reinvest it in the next crop of early stage founders. And so we want to keep doing this you know, so, yeah. So. so you guys have been investing now for what, since 2019? Is that right? We got together in 2018 and kind right. of formed the, the team. And then our first check was January 2019. Okay. So you guys aren't like 
too far along, less than, you know, less than five years old into your investment strategy with these companies, still watching them mature. Uh, it makes sense that you probably haven't exited yet with uh, some of them, right? Because, you know, just the timeline of, you know, in supporting these companies. How much of your day job is dedicated to supporting or, or looking for the exit strategy versus the, you know, finding the startup and supporting those existing startups? Mm, each one of us in the team kind of in different periods of time does different things depending on what we're looking at. Um, nowadays, I would say um, – You say about a third of the time is PR mm -hmm. the portfolio companies, helping them or at Rolodex, getting them in front of the right people and dot connecting them, helping them about a third of the time is helping our own companies connect. Mm -hmm. uh, we do a lot of events, a lot of webinars, and we feature our portfolio companies in the webinars to allow them to reach new audiences. About a third of our time is in looking at new deals. And then a third of our time is in Mazarin Labs, our incubator, where we're um, skunk working some stuff and helping the PE house I re referred to earlier and a corporate um, navigate stuff. Yeah, well, let's double click a little on this venture, you know, the, your venture lab there. You know, mm -hmm. how's that running and, and, you know, how do you select the startups to, you know, participate in the lab? Talk about the lab process here. So besides the sort of quasi consulting stuff we're doing for that corporate in the PE house, the, the core of the lab is, is incubating a business model more than incubating a, a, like a chemistry, electrochemistry, material science, microbiology, like the core science. It's trying to figure out what the right business model is for X innovation. So about a third of the innovations in labs come from outside people that have an idea they give up a little equity on the way in. And then we incubate them for however long we think is necessary before we put money in. It could be a month, it could be six months, it could be a year. So some of you outside, outside, outside mm, individuals, let's call them human capital. And they, their darn, the darn thing works, but they maybe were out in the market and they couldn't find the wind. They're like, they're back at, in the harbor and they're like, this, whatever is not working. We need to like re, reboot this. But a third of the stuff in our labs is that sort of someone outside our company has something that's not working. Let's reboot it and let's relaunch it. So we haven't, I guess Swirl Techs spent some time in our incubator. We kind of, I wouldn't say rebooted them, but we kind of loaded up their management team and their board with some of our favorite people uh, in our lab. Um, and on the way in, uh, they gave up a little bit of equity for us to be able to to incubate. So these companies have to offer uh, some shares in the company on the way in before we do anything. But I mean, it's risk for them. It's risk for us. We're getting into a marriage with a partnership where their thing apparently works. And apparently we have the Rolodex and the connections and experience to help the company realize the next goal. So both sides have to take a risk. The next third of the things in there are stu stuff we've come up with on our own, like water click and a fun one. We had this idea of, of, um, a platform as a service instead of SAS, PASS, P -A -A -S, of reimagining the procurement of digital water for smaller utilities. Small town America, they want to modernize the utility, but like, I don't know, digital twinning and AI and enterprise stuff, SCADA, it's all very confusing. It's not that they don't want to do it. It's not even they don't have money. It's just the way the digital is sold. So we skunk worked water click in our incubator for about a year. And then we reached out to our buddy Chris Sosnowski at Waterlee and his company was looking to raise some money and grow. And we said, Hey, how about if we take our incubated company in Waterlee and put it together? And like, we, we spent a year and a half in the incubator with Chris and then we relaunched Waterlee water click and it's on its way to successful things. That's probably our most high profile um, example of something that's come out of our incubator so far. We have three other things in our incubator now that are, essentially creations of, of us, like just startups that we created from scratch. Gotcha. Yeah. We're trying, to, we're trying to puzzle piece the right human capital, intellectual capital. Once it's ready, we just apply money to it. 
and they joined fund two. So, so for the, the, uh, all the startups in the lab, there is some sort of equity stake already involved with yeah. helping them versus I was kind of curious when, once they exit the lab, do you invest in all of those companies or do you just let some of them go? Right. We, we invest in all, all of them. We invest in out of our, now of our fund two, and then we get more equity. So the way in, we get a one two Z just to align interests that we're already on your cap table and we haven't done anything yet, but like, we're going to wake up on a Tuesday morning and we're going to help you. Right. And then let's say six months go by and then it's like, eh, now we know what money's going to be used for check joint fund two. So then we get two, two, two equity positions on the cap table. One is, is this and one's that. Um, the only stuff we, we, we ice is, is our own ideas that can't, we can't quite figure out how to get them to market. We've got, had probably five or six crazy ideas that are like lingering in our lab. Yeah. We just are like, we can't quite figure out what, how to make it work. Time's limited. Resources limited. Like, yeah, you gotta, you know, limited time. We could, <laughs> so we've all of the stuff in our lab right now is, is, um, is da data science related. Well, what about, let's talk, I mean, one of the biggest topics in the water industry right now, especially, well, I'd say globally, but it's definitely in the U.S., is PFOS. And what are you guys doing in tech around, you know, PFOS uh, contamination, either monitoring, uh, you know, removal, treatment, what, anything in that space? Because I think there's a huge opportunity there. Yeah. We, we got approached continue to be approached by all the PFAS destruction technology guys using ozone and advanced oxidation. And there's several different ways to destroy the long short chase PFAS bonds. Um, we're, we're, we tend to be informed by regulation um, globally. And we, we just, I know it's contrarian, but like we just don't see, we're kind of, we're bearish on PFAS destruction. They, they all work. Smart teams, the darn thing works, it destroys PFAS, great. But I just don't know that many communities or that many customers that can afford that. And but if they and so therefore for the regulatory shoe to drop and force communities to spend money they don't have. Billions. <laughs> billions on I mean, we already have PFAS in us. Of course it's not good to have it, but like I've got PFAS meat. So do you all your audience, everyone's got PFAS in us right now. So what are so and I feel pretty good. Um, so I, I don't know how they're going to regulate something when it's, it, it is conclusive. Like any doctor would be like, PFAS is not good for you. You don't want it in you, but like the science is still pretty early on it. I'm not trying to like advocate for PFAS, but I just don't understand how a regulatory shoe is going to drop on everybody. Be like, you've got to destroy it. So in the meantime, as investors, we've decided that the most plausible scenario is that in the next five years, the demand for do I have it? What kind do I have? How much do I have? Where is it? Solutions will grow like crazy. So if you are in the business of testing and monitoring of PFAS, you're sitting pretty. Well, what about, what about how, I mean, let's talk about the other big driver in the industry right now, ESG and how, how are you addressing you know, ESG concerns in the industry with uh, water tech? We don't have any concerns about it. Actually, we, we utilize the ESG chassis um, framework as, as, as core to our impact um, mandate. I, I know I, I read the news and I understand like Wall Street doesn't like ESG and Elon Musk like oh, ESG is LPS. We actually find environmental, social, and government to be three really good realms to manage impact. Um, it's interesting. So we use it. We have a scoring um, tool that we use for every company we invest in and we manage their E or S or G impacts um, as they go forward. And we're diligent in, in managing our ESG goals as a fund. What's interesting is that um, a lot of people put us in E because we're water, but actually most of our companies in fund one score higher on S. Yeah. Social S and G yeah, because water quality and contaminated water and problematic water and flooding. And it, it, that's S yeah, I mean, right. It's affecting society. Transparency of information and, and, and involving the community it is G. Making it easy for people to get their heads around and, and access water related. To, 
And then the E is, you know, protecting the crayfish and protecting the salamander. And like, that's important too. Um, so we it's all embedded. That's all embedded in your thesis, basically. I mean, I just wanted to ask the question to get your take on it because you know, it makes sense there, to there, me. There's four, there's, there's four risks that we, you know, I said at the beginning of the podcast, like water risk is our North star. Like right. that's, that's simplistic. So what are the risks that huge industry and society wake up to every day? Number one, public health and safety. The lead that's in your water, the PFAS, that's, that, that's not necessarily like a, that's a, that's a risk for my family. That's up there with COVID. I mean, water, contaminated water is a public health and safety risk. And it should probably not be managed by the EPA, but more like health and human services, in my opinion. That's another thing. So if you look at water through the lens of public health and safety, you start to see impact opportunities and you see dollar signs. Number two, the cost of water, risk. This is a risk. If the price of water goes up or we can't get water, we need, like, you need to pump it in. The cost of getting water fit for use right here where I need it right now is becoming too expensive. That's a risk. It's like, that's, that's a problem. So it's a financial thing. The third one is an environmental risk. That too much water, too little water, compromised water will kill biodiversity and kill ecosystems that everything lives on. Um, so environmental protection risk. The fourth and final one of risk that we wake up to every day is business disruption risk. If your kid's school has to shut off the water for whatever reason, yep. guess who's not going to school today? Right. Nothing Work. Or your, your facility's flooded. You can't go and manufacture a product because, you know, you sit in a low spot. and So, so that's, you know. or if the fire suppression system in a commercial office tower is out, no work that day because the fire suppression system had a leak. There was a fire just leaking on the 20th floor. It's like if the fire suppression system would work, like, I don't think it's safe to be in the building. What if there's a fire? The right. lawyers would like shut the building. Business disruption risk. Now, for companies that need water like to, to run like hydropower or pulp and paper, apparently, like, you don't have it like that's business disruption risk. So when you look at water through the lens of public health and safety, cost, environmental protection, and business disruption or business continuity risk, and then you layer on climate change, it's a lot of risk, start, a lot of start, concerns. <laughs> you, start to see, you start to see opportunities that are way more interesting than yeah, water, water's life. Yeah, and and just what, what treating wastewater treatment or you know. What, it's drinking water treatment, right? Well, the, I know it sounds, I was challenged on a panel discussion last year. Somebody's like, oh, so you're saying we just change the framing and everything's all good? Mm. Yes, no. I mean, framing matters. How you package something matters and you the lens by wh which you look at the world through matters, but it's not going to solve flooding just to look at it differently. But really, I mean, and then this sounds equally as cliche is like a lot of these problems in water are essentially data problems. Again, I know that sounds cliche. I mean, someone's daughter just died in a flood. It's like, you got a water data problem. You got a like, dead daughter problem, died in the flood. But like ultimately, if you could collect the data on that valley and the river and the precipitation, modeling, move people out of harm's way, floodwaters are coming in the next two hours. Right. So I'm moving them uphill. And then the comms to get it to their phones. That's just data. Yeah. I, I know that doesn't sound fair. Because but, but some sort of advanced warning notification or, or monitoring of that could have prevented that that occurrent that event from happening is, is basically what you're kind of getting at, which I, I would agree with that. Um, but, but there's a lot of people that argue that we need better policy, which is also true. And we need government to do more. But like if if technology could be employed to produce more data on that asset, that bit of the river. Yeah. And it could be converted and analyzed and create patterns. It's like. And democratize and reach someone's phone, like save lives and livelihoods. Well, so so we're talking about you know monitoring data or you know uh, water data and, and and you know assessing the risk associated. How are you or what do you how do you see the insurance industry addressing this? Because this has got to be a huge impact to them in their business. And are they looking for technology to shore up, you know, they their are. exposure? They are so. Insurance industry will tell you, anybody in insurance will tell you that the biggest claim globally is not burglary or fire, it's water damage. Number one, by a mile. 
And so the insurance industry, it could be water damage in your property, like a flooded dishwasher ruins the floor or whatever, or a leak in the building and the floor above, below, or the river breaches its banks. And, um, the insurance industry and the reinsurance industry are starting to make moves in water, generating water quantity data, but not to the degree that I think they should or would or could. I'm surprised right. by how, how thin the efforts are from the insurance industry and water risk. Do they pay lip service to this? Of course. The websites talk about water risk, of course. But it seems like the innovation coming out of in the insurance industry, and I'm happy to challenge anybody in your audience who's insurance, it seems like a lot of it is product innovation. Hey, we created this new product that's going to underwrite this parametric risk. Oh, hey, we got a new product that's going to like reimagine this. I don't know enough about these. They're not investing. They're not really truly investing into you know an adequate monitoring network of, of sensitive areas or areas of suspected you know water risk. To really help them better make, make more money, make more yeah, money, make more money, cover the risk, you know, address the the concerns of their insurees. I, I mean, wish someone in the audience would explain it to me because I, I I don't quite understand why they're not collecting more data on my home. The right. It's industry 4.0 right now. You can collect for cheap. Right. Data on my water use in my house. And you can take that data and you can understand anomalies and where and how there's like problems, like this is about to break, it's about to happen. I don't know. There's a company called Hippo. H-I-P-P-O is an insurance company that seems to be at the forefront of this, but like the bigger players, I, I don't know. They, they definitely are in the space, but I haven't seen moves that um, as many moves or as much action as I, I would have thought four or five years ago, but mm, we'll see. Well, that's good. Well, Hey, look, I think we're getting to the end here and I thought we might do a quick lightning round on a few questions for us, for the listeners, you know, what technologies in the market are you bullish on? Think about this for a second. Um, I like the, um, and my business partners, I mean, internally, we don't agree on every single opportunity and deal, but I really like the space of reimagining the help desk, large language models, LLM, chat GPT. Yeah. So, I've got a problem, like I'm a utility operator, I'm an industri industrial water person managing something, or I'm at home, like, I don't know, is this normal behavior of water? Am I compliant? Yeah. We actually got to we Google search something, call somebody. I don't want to lose face. I should know the answer to this. I don't want to call my buddy. I really like the genre of improved help desk tech. Any companies out there that are bringing efficiencies to, hey, I got a dumb question. <laughs> that I think will be will grow really well in the next decade for industrial, municipal, and even ag. And you're basically ingesting tons of data on lar like large language models and like all the regs in every state and everywhere in the world. And then I just take my own data and put it up and then I can query it to understand what's what. I like that. Um, pretty keen uh, on field uh, pregnancy test sensors. Do I have this? Yes or no. Do I have lead in my water? Yes or no. Do I have Legionella in my water? Yes or no. Pregnancy test. I know it's lightning round, trying to be quick. So lab and a chippy kind of stuff. Uh, and one more, and then we get to the next lightning round question. I'm going to say the space around um, buoys and lakes. People have been making buoys a long time. That's kind of like a non-sexy. It's a Warren Buffett kind of like, ah, buoy, what can you do? Better, cheaper, faster. If these things cost a fraction of what the old sky, you can put them everywhere. And the comms and, and the have real time monitoring data as far as the water quality and stuff like that in the lakes and rivers. Yeah, and I now like that. We can afford, now we can afford to put one in that part of the lake. How about if you could put six? I mean, I don't want to disrupt all the boating and stuff like that, but how about if the buoys for navigational, those could double as sensors? Yeah. Currently, dropping $100,000 per buoy is not going to work, but if they're only like a few thousand dollars, so buoy tech, it's an, it's an esoteric little weird corner of water tech. But I think in the next decade, there's going to be some winners in that space. As sea level changes and lakes and rivers become more problematic, the need to know what's Climate going on. Insecurity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I could see, yeah. Like lake swimming and, hey, I want to check what's going on with the water today. That kind of stuff. So those are three that are kind of interesting right now. Managing a lot of data with those buoys, yeah. Uh, okay, well, what, what tech are you bearish on? Atmospheric water generation. 
Sounds sexy, sounds exciting. I just don't think pulling water out of air, besides a few niche cases, people who invested obviously will disagree with me all day long, but like not 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 uh, a big on that. Um, cloud seeding, shooting iodine pellets up in the clouds, make it rain. Not that interesting. I mentioned um, PFAS destruction earlier. Not 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 ex- terribly bullish on that one. Um, anything like pipe replacement, non-revenue water, sewer inspection, bearish, bearish, bearish. Um, I, people in those, I mean, I hate to be a hater. Like people who put money in the businesses, I'm sure they're like smart people and well-intentioned and the money, like wish them the best of luck. We're just, um, what about advanced metering infrastructure? Am I? No. We we already have made our bed in that space with Flume. Flume has like the most elegant solution for how much water did this rate payer use today solution. Flume is that it for us? I can't imagine too much more that we would ever do in that. Gotcha. And the Neptunes, the Itrons, and the Badgers, and those guys like they've got their things they put in. They'll continue being they'll make money, but like I think our Flume investment is one of the more exciting things. So okay. Um, you know, and a couple other uh, we, uh, interesting ones. A mindful of time is low orbit satellites. If I mean, there's so many water assets, quote unquote. This lake is a water asset. This pipe is a water asset. This lift station is a water asset. Even the snow that's stored up in that valley that will melt is sort of water assets. The ability to get every water asset, quote unquote, into the cloud. What's going on with this asset? It was traditionally really expensive. You had to drive out there and take a look at it. Right. Remote stuff. And then, oh, cell phone towers. Yeah, a lot of these things are still not near cell phone towers, not reliable. It's like, well, you can use LoRaWAN. Like, that hasn't really panned out in the US. Europe is much more prevalent. Elon Musk comes along with Starlink. And there's a bunch of these. There's an Australian company called ESAT. There's an Israeli one called Gorilla. They're reimagining these low orbit birds that are going around the earth. And they're not used for taking pictures. They're used for bouncing signals up and then down to the cloud, up to space, down to the cloud. If you can get a data point on this asset every day, you don't even need every hour, maybe even once a week, you can start to see patterns and trends. And you can start to get out ahead of water problems by getting the, the, the assets condition, condition assessment up. Lower with satellites. I mean, Elon Musk's things, you need a $400 dish and then it's 80 bucks a month or something like that. They said, oh, I can make it cheaper if you only do one thing a day, but it's kind of expensive. But the ability to get things up in space and down to earth, I think will help humanity get out ahead of a lot of water related problems. So you'd be bullish on that tech work? Bullish. Yeah. What I'm bearish on is policy reform. Sorry, people out there who wake up every day and they work in the world of like the Beltway and policy and like, we need to change water. Well, of course, policy needs change. I'm just not holding my breath. I mean, it takes a long time. Congress is having a hard time just getting regulations passed. Uh, and people, for, water's so local. And guess what else is local politics? And if you're all the way on the right of the spectrum, yeah, yeah, don't exactly. Come near me with your federal whatever on the. So I just I'm not bullish on, or I'm not holding my breath for policy reform. I think technology is where and how industry and society get out ahead of some of these water risks. All right. Well, let's uh, let's get the, here's here's another one for you. What deal did you pass on that you regret now? Mm-hmm. You're like, man, I wish I would have done that yeah, so many, so many. because um, <laughs> they, I, I missed it. <laughs> is there anybody Transcend, out there? Transcend. Um, yeah, Transcend is a company that re- reimagined the way that engineer engineering in the beginning now they've evolved to do a lot of other stuff but it was traditionally very expensive and labor intensive and inefficient to 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 develop drawings for a plant for some process because yeah well, we're going to start from scratch and build it from scratch but like 80 20 rule a lot of this has already been done why can't we come up with software that just to use a football expression like i don't want to start on the one yard line can you get me down to like the 20 yard line and then we can start running some offense. So I like that transcend really. And then if you expand it beyond water and they're getting into the, like power grid and all kinds of other interesting stuff, that was one that it's an interesting one. Um, so you, pass, you passed on those. Yeah. It just transcend. Uh, and then the ones that we've passed on that have not done well 
I won't yeah. bring those ones up because it's not fair. Yeah, we're not going to talk about that. That's not fair. No, yeah. but there's, there is a a graveyard. I mean, we we haven't done one recently, but we were doing an event with some of our other syndicate partners, some of our other Jack books that we hang out with, called a 10-10-10 roundtable. And so we did like a invite-only webinar where we talked about 10 companies that are in market, early stage companies in market that look to be doing well, that we haven't yeah. invested in other people's stuff. Like, hey, these guys are doing well, they're doing well. 10 companies in market that are not doing well. And that's always very controversial because someone's like, no, you don't know, they are doing well, you don't have the information, we're not on the boards, we're not investors, it's hard to know, but from the outside, it looks like things aren't going well. And then 10 companies that show a lot of promise that we haven't invested in, that was sort of our companies we're in diligence on. So we call it our 10, 10, 10 round table. No PowerPoints, no logo walls, way too incriminating to like throw logos up and it gets sent around that like Mazarin doesn't like this deal. But it's, it was informative. We haven't done one in a year or so, but um, it was a helpful exercise to get Mazarin and some of our syndicate partners together to start to like al align and find areas of mutual interest um, and then find consistent, like, you know, what's the common thing across all these things is the founder or the read of the market or whatever. So, well, John, I th this has been a very interesting conversation. Uh, I really uh, appreciate you coming on the show for the listeners and any potential startups that are listening. How do they get in touch with you if they if they want to reach out and, and, and you know, bend your ear about their technology? They find me on LinkedIn, uh, John Robinson, Mazarine. Um, even if we don't invest in companies, we like to help out where possible, make introductions or a bit of you know, advice or, or mentorship. Um, yeah, just find me on LinkedIn and send me a note and um, more than welcome to um, spend a little bit of time understanding what the company does. And I mean, we're in the business of investing. Like we want to get to yes. Yeah, yeah. But it's just so hard and like, so many companies, it's like, oh, I mean, Not one hard. of the reasons we say no to company, one of the recently, one of the top reasons we're saying no is valuation. That this company, like they, they fancy themselves as a thirty million dollar company when it's like they don't even have sales. It's like, yeah. So, um, but yeah, that's, that's their vision, but they're not there yet. <laughs> yeah. So welcome, welcome introductions or welcome opportunities to make friends with people who are just as passionate about this as, as I am. And thanks, Sean, for the, the opportunity to be on your your show. And um, absolutely. Now, I really appreciate you. We'll get your contact information out, put it on the website, and uh, look forward to future conversations. We really appreciate you coming on the show. Fantastic. Thanks, Sean. Thank you.